talk to you now about Mary. Mary, mother of the most holy Eucharist. Now, the day above all other days in my life as a priest where I have been, as my father used to say, gainfully employed. He was always asking me that, are you yet gainfully employed, my boy? Well, on Saturdays, I have been very much gainfully employed, so to speak, the last 11 years. Almost every Saturday, I'm preaching somewhere. And invariably, precisely because it is a Saturday, I have something to say about the Mother of the Lord. Saturday is the day that the church uh, dedicates to her. We very often will say a votive Mass of Our Lady if we're able to on Saturday. That term, Mary, Mother of the Most Holy Eucharist, might strike you as a little bit odd. Uh, but it's really not if you know what the substance of the Eucharist is. Uh, it's not merely something, yes, the word means thanksgiving, certainly. But the Eucharist is not a mere something. Uh, the Eucharist is a divine somebody, and his name, we know, is Jesus Christ. That's the substance of the Eucharist. We know that Mary is the mother of Jesus, and Jesus is a divine person, second person of the Blessed Trinity. Hence, Mary is the mother of God. Jesus is the head of his church. Mary is the mother of Jesus. Mary is the mother of the church, as Pope Paul VI solemnly declared at the conclusion of the Second Vatican Council. So, more than anything, Mary is a mother. St. Therese, great Carmelite saint, 33rd doctor of the church, used to say she's so much more mother than queen. Our Lady's queen. She's queen of heaven and earth. But she seems so much more a mother than a queen. Now, I want you to think for a moment about mothers. I told you before, and I meant it with all my heart, that I feel to be a mother and I include our religious sisters in this because they are all spiritual mothers. To be a mother is one of the most noble, beautiful, dignified vocations imaginable. To be a mother. Now, a mother, you, the term, just like father, mother, you have to have children, right? That, 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 gives rise to the term. No children, no maternity or paternity. So mothers have children. So when you say mother, that speaks of life. If you want to gain insight into any subject, go back to the beginning. As St. Thomas said, an error in the beginning is an error indeed. So in trying to gain insight into these matters, let's go back to the beginning. And the beginning is Genesis, the first book of the Bible. In the beginning, God created all there is out of nothing. And that's what creation is by definition. God is the only one who can bring into being out of nothing, ex nihilo, out of nothing. When he had finished creating all of the works of creation, he proclaimed it good, very good. That's Genesis 1 and 2, the beginning. But then Genesis 3, something goes awry. The serpent, the most subtle, the most clever of all the creatures the Lord God had created, approaches Eve, the mother of all the living. That's what the word means, the name Eve, mother of all the living. Did God tell you that you cannot partake of the trees in the garden? Well, no, Eve said, God said, we may partake of all the trees in the garden. Note that human freedom is very broad. 
However, God said we may not partake of the tree in the center of the garden or even touch it lest we die. Human freedom has limits, and the limits are laid down by God. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil. The one that Jesus would one day call a liar and the father of lies, a murderer from the beginning, said to Eve, surely you do not believe God. Oh, no. God doesn't want you to be like himself. God knows that if you partake of the forbidden fruit, your eyes will be opened and you will be able to see for yourselves what is good and what is evil. St. Thomas Aquinas says that the original sin had to have been pride. I can be like God, knowing subjectively and arbitrarily what is good and what is evil. I'll decide for myself what's good for me. That's how it was from the beginning. The original sin, it hasn't changed, goes like this today. I'm sophisticated. I'm educated. I can decide for myself what's good for me, what's not good for me. I don't have to listen to an old Polish pope. I can decide for myself when life begins and when life ends. Artificial contraception. We play God, trying to decide when life begins. Suicide, abortion, murder, euthanasia, playing God, trying to decide when life begins and when life ends. And so we have a death wish in our culture, a culture of death. Eve, the mother of all the living, became the mother of all the dead and dying. Pride, I can be like God. Disobedience, partaking of the forbidden fruit, and the ultimate consequence, death. It was at that moment that death entered creation. That is the prototype of all sin. Pride, now, when I say pride, you understand what I mean. I do not mean that healthy pride, like I take pride in my work. I'm proud of my children. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about what's expressed by the Greek term hubris. It's self-centered, egotistical arrogance, which seeks to exalt the creature above the creator. That's the pride that I'm talking about. So, pride, disobedience, death. Eve, mother of all the living, becomes the mother of all the dead and dying, and death descends on creation. Then in the fullness of time, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, and if anyone has problems with the dignity of woman, let them meditate on that passage of Scripture for a very long time. Born of a woman. To deliver from the law those who were subject to the law. Galatians 4.4. 4. How did Jesus come? Through a woman, the new Eve. Our blessed mother was called the new Eve by the fathers, doctors of the church. She became the real mother of all the living. What was the way, the method, the disposition that she had in order to counteract this movement of death? Humility obedience, life, the antidote for the original sin. Pride, disobedience, death, that's Eve. Humility, obedience, life. 
That's the Blessed Mother, the new Eve. She is of enormous importance to us in the church and in the world. Now, most people cannot see these things because they do not have a spiritual mind. And you can talk until you're blue in the face to the worldly person, and they just won't get it. Things are received according to the mode of the receiver. That's an axiom in metaphysics. Things are received according to the mode of the receiver. In other words, you get what you're able to get. Your disposition determines what you're able to receive. Now, as a kindergarten teacher, back in Florida when I first began, I was teaching a group of lay evangelists, and at one point the leader of this group leaped to his feet in a fervor of spirit, and he, and he yelled out one of the most notable compliments I've ever received in my life. And he said, thanks be to God for Father Karapi, the rotor rooter of my soul. <laughs> I've never had a compliment quite like it. <laughs> what he meant was, some of what I was saying, <laughs> the, the Holy Spirit had hit him. I, I, whatever I said, I don't even remember what it was. It hit him, it opened him up. He had some impediments. You know, in theology, sacramental theology, uh, there's, a, there's an expression, the sacraments work in virtue of their own power irrespective of the holiness of the minister and so forth. Ex opera operato. They always leave out the second part of the dictum, however. Obicem non ponentibus. The sacraments indeed work in virtue of their own power if you don't posit an obstacle. And the obstacle is sin. To the degree we are open to grace, we receive grace. If the pipes are clogged, Grace is not going to flow freely. So you see, you can understand that kindergarten lesson, right? Real simple. That's what's called in-your-face truth. We need to be open. Our Lady had receptivity as one of the most important qualities of her soul. Perfectly transparent perfectly pure, perfectly open, perfectly disposed, perfectly enabled to receive all the grace, and it is indeed a singular grace that she was given. Now you just think for a moment. If you and I could create our own mother, what a good job we'd do. Hmm? If you and I could create mom, we would create her just as intelligent, just as gifted, just as pure, just as holy as we possibly could. If you could create your own mother, would you create her with the devil having any ability to have power over her? Now, I wouldn't do that to my mother. If I had the power to exempt her from the devil's dominion, even for a second, you better believe, that's the way I'd create her. God not only could, but did create his own mother. And he did it with absolute perfection, perfectly pure, no sin, no original sin, no personal sin. And I always like to throw in, in just to aggravate some people and to confuse some people, nor could she sin. Very often, you know, they get it when you say, no original sin, that's the Immaculate Conception. Uh, no personal sin, that's the result uh, of that purity. Nor could she sin. And they say, well, how can that be? She must not be free. Oh, no. She's truly free. I'd ask the question, can the blessed in heaven sin? No, they cannot. Are they free? Oh, yes. With the glorious freedom of the children of God, that's true liberation. That's authentic liberation. Our Lady was free, all right. What's freedom? The ability to do whatever you want to do? Nope, that's not authentic human freedom. Freedom is the power to do what we ought to do, the highest good, 
to know God, to love God, and to serve God with our whole heart, mind, and strength. That's authentic human freedom. Not being able to do whatever you want to do, but a power to do what you ought to do. There is a fundamental flaw in the understanding of that important reality of freedom. But Our Lady is the new Eve. She conceived Jesus in her heart before conceiving him in her womb, some of the fathers and doctors of the church said. She conceived him in her immaculate heart before conceiving him in her womb, in her perfect purity. That's a gift from God. Immaculately conceived. Now, there was a struggle about that in the uh, history of the church. We couldn't quite, theologians couldn't figure it out. They couldn't come up with a solution to that problem. Now, as often happens, uh, the lay faithful having the sensus fidelium, they have a sense, a taste for the faith that comes with baptism, as long as they preserve that or in a state of grace, they have a sense. And the, the faithful always knew that Our Lady must be immaculately conceived, but it's another thing for the theologians to be able to come up with the precise language and the precise understanding required for a dogmatic definition. The theologians, even the great St. Thomas Aquinas, they just couldn't arrive at it. Now, Scripture says, all fall short of the glory of God. That means we all have sin. And in trying to work this problem out, they couldn't quite get it. So the best they could come up with is, well, Mary must have had sin uh, just for an instant, the original sin. Must have had that sin just for an instant. That's the best they could do, but the people in their hearts said, uh uh, nope. You know, my grandmother would have been one of those uh, great theologians uh, amongst the laity who said, look, Mr. Theologian, you know, I know you're trying your best, but you didn't quite get it. No cigar. Try again. <laughs> and that's the way it was. So finally it took a great Franciscan theologian, Dun Scotus, to come up with a solution. Once again, as I tried to explain to you how we don't repeat the sacrifice of Calvary, rather we enter into it and make it present and making use of the uh, theological principle of theandric actions, the action of the God-man in order to bring that about. It's the same principle applied. Jesus is Lord. He's second person of the Blessed Trinity, a divine person. He is outside time and space, as all the Trinity is transcending time and space. Before the Paschal mystery ever unfolded in time and space, from all eternity, God knew, God willed, redemption. Mary, the moment she is conceived, is conceived without sin. No original sin. How can that be if all fall short of the glory of God? Well, because she was preserved in advance from that sin. Whereas we receive the fruits of redemption after the fact. We are conceived, we are born, we are baptized. The sacrament, as it were, reaches in to the Paschal mystery, which transcends time and space. And it is applied. At that moment we are baptized and we are washed clean of the original sin. The fruits of redemption are applied in advance to Mary. And that, that was the theological solution to that thorny problem. And so the definition uh, of the Immaculate Conception then would, would come later. But we know that Our Lady had no sin. Now that's a doctrine of the faith. We as Catholics believe that. You must believe that. It doesn't say you must understand it, only that you must believe it. No original sin, no personal sin, nor could she sin. She was free, liberated from the bondage of sin, perfectly clean. That is what made her the perfect vessel for the incarnate word, like a tabernacle 
that received her God. That's the incarnation. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. Why? Because a little Jewish girl said yes to God. She didn't understand it. You say, prove it. Well, look what happened. First chapter of the Gospel of Luke. The angel Gabriel comes to her, announces God's plan, the Annunciation. You will conceive and bear a son. Well, how can this be? Well, I don't have a husband. I know not man. How can this be? That She didn't understand it all. But she believed it all. How do I know? By her response. Fiat, mihi secundum verbum tuum, be it done unto me, according to thy word. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. Her humble, obedient response. She did not understand it all, but she believed it all. The woman of faith, from beginning to end. The new Eve, the mother of all the living. She said yes to God. Humble obedience. What happened? The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. The one who would later say, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Life itself is conceived in the womb of the Virgin. Tremendous mystery. The antidote for death is the conception of life in itself. We know that God's very essence is to exist. Uh, in Christian philosophy, metaphysics, uh, we say that. God's very essence is to exist. We intuit that from the Old Testament, you remember on the mount when Moses saw the burning bush and God spoke to him from that burning bush? Go tell the Israelite people, I am sent you. Tell the Israelite people, I am who am sent you. And we, from that very mysterious communication from God through Moses, we have intuited that to mean that God's very essence is to exist. I am. God is. Everything else is contingent being, dependent upon God for its very existence. That's life. What's life? God is life. How did that life come to us in a very unique way? Through Mary, through the incarnation. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. Humanity and divinity united in a most intimate way, a sacramental way, an unbelievable way. Divinity and humanity coming together to subsist in the divine person of the incarnate Word. And that happened through Mary. We live in very strained times. Uh, we live at a time in history where death stalks from beginning to end. Every 40 seconds, someone commits suicide on the face of the earth. Every 60 seconds, a murder takes place. From artificial contraception to abortion to suicide, assisted suicide, murder, genocide, and euthanasia. From beginning to end, death stalks humanity. We have a latent death wish, and we are living through dark and perilous times. What is the antidote for death? Life. And it is the mother of all the living who brings that life to us. What is life? God is life. Jesus is life. How did Jesus come to us? Through Mary. How do we go to Jesus? Through Mary, if you've got any spiritual sense. And you say, I don't have to do that. People say that every now and then, you know. Oh, I don't have to do that. Well, amen, brother. <laughs> you don't have to do anything. You know, I, I have some friends before the current situation who had a good stockbroker, a real clever, sharp guy, 
and he knew the stock market. Now, they could have said, I don't need a stinking stockbroker. Uh, but they kind of trusted this guy, and he was very clever, and he knew the market, and he made them a fortune. It was smart to use the broker. Now, in case you don't already know it, because I've said it about two million times since I've been started preaching, Mary is my broker. <laughs> That's right. The Blessed Mother's my broker. Now, to be honest with you, I don't have a whole heck of a lot to invest. I am what you might call spiritually poor. I am not too swift when it comes to spiritual things. There are a lot of people much more spiritual than I am, certainly a heck of a lot smarter than I am, better educated than I am. There's no question about that. And when it comes to doing penance and sacrifice and prayer, uh, I'm a peasant, and I know it. But even peasants can be clever and often are. And so I take my pittance of a spiritual inheritance, I take my few little prayers, my few little sacrifices, and I give them to my broker. It passes through her immaculate hands, it is purified and magnified, and what is little becomes much. Hence my investment matures and I reap a very substantial return on investment. That's what my broker, the Blessed Mother, does for me. Now, the commercial used to say, when E.F. Hutton speaks, people listen. Well, I got news for you. When Mary speaks, God listens. <laughs> She's the mother of the Holy Eucharist because she's the mother of Jesus who is the substance of the Eucharist. She's the mother of all the living. And in this attack on life, we need such a mother to lead us into the fullness of life. I'll never forget the first time I was on EWTN. Jeff Cavins was interviewing me. Mother was on a plane headed for Spain. And uh, at the end of the show, Jeff said, Father, if you could tell our listeners one thing. Now, eventually, millions of people will see this show. If you, you only have a couple minutes. He really put me on the spot. But that doesn't bother me a bit. He <laughs> said, you only have a couple of minutes. What would you tell all of our listeners if you could only give them one piece of advice? Now, I could have said lots of good things. I could have said, make a holy hour every day. Spend time with the Eucharistic Lord, and I've often said that. I could have said, read the Bible every day. Study the catechism of the Catholic Church. Learn your faith. I could have said, help the poor. All excellent things to do. I didn't have time to think out a reasoned response. I had to trust when Jesus, who said, don't worry about what you're to say. Your Father in heaven will give you the words. And he did. And he said, pray the rosary. That's what I said. One piece of advice. I said it then. I say it now. Pray the rosary. <laughs> now, you may think once again, as that eminent left-wing theologian described me as a simpleton and, and probably was right in many respects, that, that may seem like an overly simplistic answer, but I'm telling you, you pray the rosary, because if you will do that, you will be given grace to do everything else you need to do. Do that first. Why? Why? You say, it's not biblical, and I say, oh, oh I'm glad you brought that up. <laughs> Let's look at the rosary. Why is it so powerful? Quite simply because it's the prayer of the gospel. The gospel. What's the gospel? You know, the good news. <laughs> well, what do you mean by that? Look, the rosary is kind of like us. It has a body and a soul. You know what the soul is to the body? It's, the soul is the form of the body. The soul is the animating force of the body. The soul is what breathes life into the body. The rosary has a soul. The meditation on the 15 mysteries. That's the soul of the rosary. 
Well, what's that, mysteries? Well, just look at them. The Annunciation, where'd that come from? First chapter, Gospel of Luke. The Visitation, the Nativity, Presentation in the Temple, Finding in the Temple, Agony in the Garden, Scourging at the Pillar, Crowning with Thorns, Carrying of the Cross, Crucifixion, Resurrection, Ascension, Descent of the Holy Spirit. The first 13 are straight out of the Gospel. The last two can be deduced from Scripture. What about the prayers, you say? How is that biblical? Well, the Our Father. Where'd that come from? Pope make it up? <laughs> nope. Nuns against the Pope might say that. <laughs> you say you're asking for trouble. <laughs> That's right. Our Father. Lord, teach us how to pray. When you pray, you ought to say, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Gospel prayer. Yeah, but what about that Hail Mary? I'm glad you asked. Hail, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. The angel salutation, first chapter of the Gospel of Luke. Hail, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, Elizabeth says. Blessed is the fruit of your womb. Gospel prayer. You got it? The 15 mysteries, the prayers, our Father, help. that's gospel prayer. What's the gospel? means good news, that word. Good news. What is the good news? Something? No. Somebody. The gospel is somebody. And his name is Jesus Christ. When you pray the rosary, you pray the gospel. You pray the good news. You pray Jesus. You begin to interiorize Christ. You become who you are, the body of Christ, made holy and empowered to do the works of Christ. That is the rosary. And that's why you should pray it every single day. And if you think you're too sophisticated or too educated to pray the rosary, you're too sophisticated and you're too educated if you think that. So stop it. <laughs> in this time of intense spiritual combat, in this time when the forces of death seem to have been unleashed on the world, in this battle between the forces of good and the forces of evil, between truth and lies, good and evil, light and darkness, life and death. God has given us a battlefield commander. And that is why I say that the title of this talk could very well be, Your Mama Wears Combat Boots. <laughs> That's right. She's the leader of an army because her son gave her that battlefield commission. Once after I preached at the University of Notre Dame, some women came up to me, and I think that's the first time I ever used that term, your mama, or that expression, your mama wears combat boots, and these ladies had taken a statue of the Blessed Mother, and believe it or not, they glued on little combat boots. <laughs> Thus giving rise to a new Marian devotion, your mother of the combat boots. Well, Our Lady teaches us the ways of war, and it is a paradoxical kind of a war with spiritual weapons like the rosary, where humility becomes nuclear power, where the Blessed Eucharist becomes the force that can knock down any stronghold and scale any wall. This is indeed the war to end all wars. And Our Lady helps us. She helps us to enter into that fullness of life, which is her Son. That fullness of life, which is Jesus in the Eucharist. I'm going to tell you something that I know in my heart is absolutely certain. It is not a church teaching formally so, and so you don't have to believe it if you don't want to. But I'm telling you that in this day and age, it is our Blessed Mother who is leading us to a very great 
victory. You have to be very close to your mother. I would say this to every seminarian, to every priest. In these times of spiritual warfare, intense combat, head-on, hand-to-hand combat with Satan himself, you must be close to the woman who is the battlefield commander of God's army. And that's biblical. Uh, from, the first Bible, from the first book of the Bible to the last, that's very b- biblical. The Proto-Evangelium in chapter 3 of Genesis. What does God say Af- after he catches the serpent? What have you done? What does God say? He says, I will put enmity... Enmity, those are fighting words. I will put enmity between you, devil, and the woman, between your offspring and hers. And the war was on. And it's been raging ever since. The last book of the Bible, Genesis, or the Apocalypse, chapter 12. And there appeared in the heavens a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon at her feet, and a crown of twelve stars about her head, and she did battle with the red dragon. From beginning to end, from Genesis to Revelation, that woman clothed with the sun, yes, the church, yes, the Blessed Mother. Whether we like it or not, whether we believe it or not, we are locked in a life-and-death struggle with the forces of evil. And I tell you as the best possible advice I can give you, be close, very close to the mother of the Lord. She is leading us into deep communion with her Eucharistic son. True devotion to Mary will lead you to the Eucharist. Please know that beyond any shadow of a doubt. Our Lady does not just bring you to herself she moves you to her Son. And Jesus brings you to the Father in the power of the Holy Spirit. That's how it works. The Eucharist, that's what's going to conquer evil. It is the Eucharist that is going to transform the world. Our Blessed Mother is leading us into deep communion with the Holy Eucharist. You must make progress. Many of you, still don't make a holy hour. Many of you still don't visit the Blessed Sacrament, and you're the best. You're the cream of the crop, the pillars of the church. You're the hope of the world. You still aren't making a holy hour. The last few years of his life, the great Archbishop Fulton Sheen dedicated himself totally toward one end, to get priests to make a holy hour. That's what Our Lady wants from all of her children. She's drawing us to Jesus in the Eucharist. You tell me you have problems. You tell me that your family is being split apart. You tell me you have cancer. You tell me you're dying of this. You tell me your husband left. what, What advice do I have for you? Draw near to Our Lady who will bring you close to Jesus in the Eucharist. Go into the chapel, to the church. If you can't give an hour to make a holy hour, then give a minute. Like the story I once heard about a guy named Joe. Now, Joe was probably from the UP. (laughs) And Joe had a very pious wife. And every day, his wife Mary would go to church, go to Mass, But Joe, being a a busy kind of guy, uh, he had to go to work early in the morning. But but Joe would drop his wife off at the church, and she'd go in to spend time with the Lord and uh, assist at Mass. But Joe would just stick his head in the back door, and he said, Hi, Jesus, it's Joe. And then he'd go to work. So he did it for years. Well, Joe finally died. And he went up to what he wasn't sure. He, He didn't know where he was. He was put in a little room and made to wait there, and uh, after a while, he started to get nervous because he wasn't quite sure which place he was in. And then finally, the door creaked open, 
And the head went out through the crack in the door. And the person said, Hi, Joe, it's Jesus. Come on in. (laughs) Even if it's only a minute. Even if it's only a minute, spend a little time with the Lord in the Eucharist. Enter into Our Lady's Immaculate Heart. It is a safe place. That is a spiritual secret the Holy Spirit once taught me. People ask me all the time, especially at events like this, Father, pray for me. Father, pray for my children. Father, pray for my husband. Father, pray for my pastor. And that's a very serious request. I've always taken it seriously. And people might think, oh, he doesn't really do it. How could he do it? I've had thousands of people ask me for prayers over the years. I take it seriously. I'm going to tell you a secret how I do it. I don't waste a single one. You say to me, Father, pray for me. I immediately make an intention. I place you, your son, your daughter, your husband, your wife, your pastor, I place you, simple act of the will, in the immaculate heart of Mary. That is a safe place. I may forget ten years later, but Our Lady doesn't forget a thing. I place you in the Immaculate Heart of Mary. It's like a garden. It's the mystical garden of God. You know what a garden is? A garden is a place where optimal conditions for life exist. Carmel is a word that means garden of God in Hebrew. Karemel, God's garden. Very lush place, Mount Carmel in the Holy Land. Good garden. I'm going to give you now a gardening lecture to close. In a good garden, and I'm talking about Our Lady's Immaculate Heart as the garden of God. That's where I'm placing all of you. You've got good soil. Do you know the word humus? That, that's rich soil, you know, very uh, organic, good, rich soil, humus. Uh, that is from the same Latin root as humility, right? The rich soil in the garden of the Immaculate Heart of Mary is humility. She's the humble handmaid of the Lord. Jesus himself told us what the seed is. The seed is the Word of God. You need water for a good garden? What's the water? You remember what happened at Meribah? I told you how Moses struck the rock with the wooden staff, and the water flowed out. The rock is Christ, struck with the wood of the cross, gives forth the life-giving waters of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the spouse of the Blessed Mother. The waters that water her immaculate heart, her, that garden of God, the Holy Spirit. You need oxygen. You've got to cultivate the land, turn it over, break up the soil. Why do you do that? To oxygenate it. You need oxygen. No oxygen, no life. Do you know what the word in Hebrew for Holy Spirit is? Ruach HaKodesh. Breath of God. The oxygen of God is the Holy Spirit. And so, once again, that's the very air that we breathe in the Immaculate Heart of Mary. And you need sunlight. For a garden, no sunlight, no photosynthesis. No photosynthesis, no green plants can grow, no life. Jesus is the Son. The Son of God, the Son of Mary, the Son of Justice that shines brightly in His mother's heart. The Immaculate Heart of Mary, mystical garden of God. I place each one of you and all your loved ones in the immaculate heart of Mary, now and for all eternity. God bless you.